Bwa ha 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 My name is Amy too, and welcome back to TechSynth. Continuing on the alphabet thing, and uh, the, while uh, I mean, since the last one they introduced a new uh, model that's larger, but I discovered that uh, in order to do the alphabet thing, it's better to choose the smallest model because when you go to the large models, it's like or like the is a factor of the it's <laughs> anyway f <laughs> f e a s is the first time since the symptom uh, simpsons in 1998 that this theme has been referenced on television on the surface, the song is an all-star combination of pop elements, <laughs> but is more complex than that. The first two singles, Papa's New Shoes and I Should Be There, borrow many cues from the Beatles' White Album, the second offering. Don't look back in anger. Also borrows heavily from the Beatles' song, Yellow Submarine, while Wish You Were Here takes on many Beatles-influenced elements from Bob Dylan's Lights of Home, including a guitar-driven piano line. <laughs> what? <laughs> to put it another way, it's a mix between the Beatles and the Dylan of the Beatles, and a Bob Dylan song. The Beatles song, the other Beatles song, New Girl, makes one hell of a match. Especially considering that the song's main purpose in the series... The internet's dead. Well, the internet's dead, so I have to wait until it comes back in order to continue this video. Okay, it's back. Uh, the show's main... I mean, the song's main purpose in this series is to show a band. Or at least a band on the fringe. <laughs> what? On <clears throat> The Simpsons, this can be viewed from a social perspective, as Homer attempts to be at the center of the band. What? <laughs> Yet being the last to notice the group. Wait, what? I only watched a little bit of The Simpsons, so I don't know if this is accurate at all. <laughs> at this point, the song was a strong contender for the Song of the Week slot. <laughs> But I was ultimately given a second chance at the Christmas Eve, December 3rd, 1993 episode, Bart of Darkness. Wait, what? Let me search this. Is this a real episode? It is! Season 6, episode 1. Okay, yeah. Anybody who actually knows something about Simpsons will be like, Well, duh! I <laughs> But yeah, I didn't really watch like any of it. This song is used twice more on the series. Once as background music in an episode, and once in an episode, The Creps of Wrath. Is that another ep real episode? Looks like it, yeah, season one, episode 11. I didn't even watch that far. <laughs> I watched like four or five episodes, that's it. When the episode Bart vs. Thanksgiving... Okay, another one to search. <laughs> I'm assuming that these are all real episodes. Yeah, this, this one's too. Season 2, episode 7. The song is used in the opening sequence. But what song is this, uh, anyway? <laughs> it listed a whole bunch of them, but which one is it? So, however, in that instance, it is changed for a more familiar the for to a more familiar the Beatles tune, "Twist and Shout." Yeah, that I know is a song. <laughs> the song is ranked number twenty-two on the series list of all time fa all time favorites. It is tied for the second highest. Wait, what? Doesn't make any sense. Gee. Um, let's see if it goes with this one on large model. No, it doesn't. Of course it doesn't. Um, it's gonna do this. I'll try medium model. Ah. Not 
No, this is just talking about filters and stuff. <laughs> Giphy.com. That's it? G. In the early 19th century. So I can add no more here on the subject of the importance of the idea that the two types of people were fundamentally, fundamentally different. What? As far as I can see, both categories of individuals are a product of an evolutionary history from early man to the modern era. What are we even talking about? This is a historical account, and though it is often claimed that the categories are universal in origin, I think there is no question of this. There is plenty of common ground between the category of the animal and the category of the human. I... <laughs> I have even seen a number of people claim that the categories are just an adaptation to human nature. <laughs> Such people often assume that the fact that we humans are anthropomorphic <laughs> makes us unique in this category. Um, as I recall, anthropomorphic uh, is basically things that are human-shaped. Uh, like human, human like, not, um, you know, it, we're, we don't just happen to be that. The name comes from us. <laughs> it makes us unique in this guy. I must admit that we, I have been guilty of this, and I admit that I have seen some people use anthropomorphism in this way, such as the British writer Peter S. Beagle. Who insert? Who is this guy? I like searching names. For one thing, he's not British. Uh, he's not a British uh, not a writer. He's an American novelist. <laughs> what are the books that he uh, that he wrote? Last Unicorn, 1968. Two Hearts, 2005. The Innkeepers, uh, 1993. Ta and Thompson, 1999. In okay. I don't think I've read any of these books before. So, yeah. Who asserts that <clears throat> the human is the only animal capable of thought? <laughs> Calling us an animal. And therefore of language. And therefore of books. <laughs> Beagle 1992. 20. As long as such a person is willing to admit that the idea of man's uniqueness is only a reflection of his historical conditions then there's no problem. The problem arises when people think that uniqueness is intrinsic to man's nature and use of language. In such a case, if you don't like uh, this kind of thinking, you might call yourself a Darwinian, <laughs> who go beyond Darwinism, and there... <laughs> And there are many people, uh, there are many who prefer not to be called Darwinian. <laughs> but the most important difference between the two types of humans is that the one is social in the sense of the other. <laughs> what? <laughs> that is, both of them interact socially with each other. In this sense, therefore, they are different. <laughs> its sense does not make any sense. This one is a social being, and the other is... I don't know if that is, the is like, the actual thing with the Darwin thing, but it doesn't sound like it is. <laughs> if that really was from there, I'm surprised that anybody believes it. <laughs> H. Hmm. We've got, uh... Okay, that's not really a URL. Um, photos 2011 uh, 10 uh, 13 photo of red roof soda coffee coffee pops <laughs> what seven the <clears throat> popsicle is a <clears throat> vibrant new american dream that is coming and <laughs> what happens to the world a brief history of a toy in this story a pop culture <clears throat> reform movement began with this pop culture <clears throat> reform movement that involved the introduction of pepsi cola into the world the history of the beverage a product that was introduced into the world with soda 
<laughs> was based on an original creation by a Russian inventor named Nikolay Nikolayshko. Nikolay, okay, who's this guy? Whoa! Google did not come up with any results. Was not expecting that. According to the Guinness Book of World Records, the Pepsi Cola has been around since 1907. Is that actually true? Originally created and developed in 1893. <laughs> yeah. Which also suggests that there uh, was plenty of time for more than one person to invent a new soda drink. <laughs> what? This guy that doesn't exist, of course, uh, was one of the group of young scientists and engineers, <laughs> scientists working on a soda, <laughs> and engineers working for a firm called N. Nicholas and Sons, who were experimenting with a range of new products for their family company, a food and drink business, which they set up in, set up in St. Petersburg in 1897. Reason encyclopedia. An encyclopedia entry on the history of the brand. The St. Petersburg Company later moved to New York, where the invention was patented in 1907. <laughs> Nikolay was a talented inv inventor. Yeah, an inventor of soda. Even while still a student at the Nikolaev uh, Polytechnic Institute. Is that a real institution? Um, I don't think so. You got ones that are similar, but not it. After graduating in 1897, he was hired by one of the first uh, one of the first big producers of w Russian wines. The first big wine has been around for a long time, dude. So I would assume that. No, 1897, I don't think that that's going to be the first big producer. <laughs> Unless you're talking about, like, you know, mega company big. <laughs> there he worked on improving the quality of wine bottles, especially bottles made of glass. Yeah, what else were they made of back then? Writes the Guinness Book of World Records. <laughs> Nikolay worked in this industry for more than 20 years but yet he like um, okay never mind on his return to Russia in 1906 he moved to the US and set up his own company wait what he moved to Russia and then he moved back to the States well then and sons in New York the business soon expanded and it soon became the biggest producer of sparkling wine in America <laughs> in 1910, after meeting a group of American soldiers, he came up with the idea of a new soft drink. <laughs> a year later, the Pepsi Cola was invented. No, it was not. And the company set up its own bottling plant. <laughs> Nikolay and his uh, fellow engineers developed the idea, and his life, Lyubov, Lyubov, came up with the first recipe. The first recipe. <laughs> the first recipe was written on a telegraphic pad by his wife. <laughs> telegraphic pad? Who was a pharmacist, continues the encyclopedia. <laughs> From this humble be beginning, Pepsi Cola quickly grew. The company later expanded to se several countries and became one of the top companies of its kind in the world. It eventually moved its headquarters to New York, where it was already there. In the same city where it, where the company was founded. Yeah. Pepsi Cola's success was due to the efforts of many people. Nikolay himself made a crucial contribution. Yeah, because he was the creator. Working tirelessly to make the product a hit. Other pioneers of the product included the inventor of the bottle cap. William Painter. Is that true? You know, something tells me no, because it's a company for sunglasses. Polarized Japanese nylon lenses? <laughs> Wait, what is this uh, site? I want to see what it looks like. Yeah, some I somehow doubt that this 
guy created the bottle cap. How about no? The first soda water was in, was made, but it keeps changing. What it keeps adding stuff. The first soda was water was made by one of the fathers of the modern American pharmacy industry. What? Charles H. Par Parmenter. Nicolay died in 1951, aged 82. I, I 86. He is buried in the cemetery in East Chester, New York. No, because. I searched his name, it's not real. With the uh, last name thing? Okay. Well, when you search this guy, the first image that shows up here is a gravestone. So, yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. 1899 to 1974. Rest in peace. Whoever you are. I like how it pulls stuff out of nowhere. I. I'm sorry, he says. What kind of name is this? <laughs> what? <laughs> I want a girl who is as smart as me, he says more loudly than is healthy. <laughs> <laughs> it's like... I WANT TO GO AS AS FAR AS ME! <laughs> I've lived in the same apartment for five years now. We shared two bedroom. <laughs> two bedroom. And one bedroom shared by two. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> After the divorce, and in parentheses, which I've tried so hard to ignore for so many years. And with my son in a very different setting and in parentheses, who never got on with me until late childhood. I found myself in a small apartment of three bedrooms, two shared by me and my son. What? what? That, was the la that was the last we had a bed together. What? <laughs> Terrible grammar. I, at least on one night I had to get into my son's room to turn off the lights in the closet okay. on the other night he wasn't in bed and he came out to play with me so I moved in and did my laundry we also had separate sets of bedroom doormats which I'd removed years ago and I couldn't even get rid of what is this and I couldn't even get rid of these. He has a little space, which I think he loves to go through. As he likes to get lost in the things in there. What is this? If it gets out of control, like after he's had a nightmare, I have to be the nagging mother. I thought you were the dad. I know he likes to th find things and have things on his bed. <laughs> what? A lot of times, I've got to chase after him and say, What are you doing? Stop! You're only gonna waste time! I'd rather, rather spend uh, time with my son, so I put up with the things I don't like, and the things he likes in his room. <laughs> the fact that he has this room at all. It's the space, and it's his space, and I'll let him live in it. Sometimes he'll let me li live in his space, and we'll have a good few good nights together. Together, I can have good conversations. He has good dreams. We can just hang out together. This is really oh creepy. But I don't like it when he acts like he doesn't need the, his space. I don't like it when he tries to control how much space is in his room. For example, we have boxes all over the floor. Sometimes he wants to put away a bunch of clothes at once. And if I make him pick them up, he's really sad. If I force him to do that, he cries. And I think... And he thinks, you're hurting me. And I say, I'm not. I want you to save your clothes for tomorrow. I'm not hurting him. I want to keep him out of a lot of clutter in this room. I don't want him to put away things that, he, that won't go together. Things he's not wearing. Things that don't belong in his closet. Okay. 
I, it gets on my nerves, and he's five. I'm just trying to get him in, to make good choices. I am the same way. When we get something we've always wanted, like a certain video, <laughs> what? <laughs> like a certain video? Game system, I will try to explain to him how important it is to us to get this, and that we'll really have to work hard at it. <laughs> the video game system? I will tell him, we are lucky to get this because it is really expensive, and y yeah, well, you know, you could have, you know, not bought it. <laughs> we, like, you're lucky, you bought it, like, what does luck have to do with that? You, you had the money, you, you, like, is that really luck? And you and I ha have to make sure we're working hard at it. We've had to explain to him, we can't let it just sit here. We can't use it to, or just leave it out, or we're going to get used to it, and then we won't want to play it. I'm really good ex at explaining these things to him. <laughs> oh, are you? But then sometimes he wants to do th some things that it, it just is not right. Like play a certain video game with friends on it, or play on a certain kind of video game system. And he wants to make sure that he does whatever he wants. And he doesn't even listen. He says, no, no, you can't do that. You can't do that. And <laughs> What is this? J. J. Abrams. This story goes that one minute Abrams had been drinking with some friends while waiting for them in line to watch the premiere of the upcoming Transformers movie at Universal Studios. When he heard that there would be four Transformers films in theaters, with a new character, he said, Hey, do you guys want a free drink after the movie? That's a cool idea. Give me a hug and I'll give you my tickets. What? <laughs> Abrams did get the free drink and decided to sit on one of the tickets, leaving it at the theater. Well, that's dumb. The man came over to meet Abrams, and Abrams said, Hey, do you want to see my tickets? Then Abrams <laughs> asked the man where he was from. The man just smiled and said, San Diego. Abrams went on to ask a question, and when he opened the ticket and showed him the new Transformers movie set up uh, next to the old one, what? Abrams said, I bet these guys really know what they... I want to finish the video. Oh, it's back. I bet these guys really know what they're doing, right? I mean, these are all the same robots. They are just different versions. The what? That doesn't even make sense. The movie went on to become the highest grossing movie of the year. The stuff that draws strange. What? On October 10th, 2002. A few men at the New York City bar noticed that there was a live show at the New York City Club R5 playing by a rock band called The Stuff That Draws Them. <laughs> what? Is that a real thing? Stuff That Draws Them. No, it isn't. The Stuff That Draws Them. They had seen the band perform on television several times and were excited to be able to see them in person. The band opened with <clears throat> The Thing by Metallica, which got a strong reaction from the crowd. I mean, the crowd. They played many of their songs, including <clears throat> The Thing and a cover of Rush's Tom Sawyer. Wait, what? Is that an actual Rush song? Oh, it is a song by uh, Rush. Okay. But uh, I mostly know about it as a book. See, not everything it spouts is utter trash. Many of the attendees were wearing <clears throat> the Stuff That Draws Them t-shirt. <laughs> After the show was over, the bartenders come to collect the money. What? The bartenders? 
They had a difficult time getting anyone to pay. Finally, a man with a Metallica shirt came and took a ticket from the drummer. What the hell is this? asked the bartender, who was annoyed that he had not been able to give the band a good tip. What's the cover band? said the man. They're not Metallica. What the hell is this? asked the bartender again. The man just shrugged. They're called the stuff that draws them, he said, then walked away. The next day, the same thing happened again. Then it happened again the next day. After about four days, the bartender said, Listen, we don't care if it's a cover band or Metallica. We know who they are, and we're not going to give them money. <laughs> them the money. Wait a second, said the man. I have Metallica shirts. I don't care if... What is this? I don't care if it's Metallica or the stuff that draws them. I want to know why they get money and we don't. Probably because they're the band. <laughs> the bartender scratched his head. What? I don't understand, he said. Is that the every week you get these guys in here wearing t-shirts with Metallica on them and they don't tip? Yeah, said the man, but those aren't Metallica. I recognize the music. The stuff that draws them sounds like Metallica. Well, said the bartender, they are probably the biggest cover band in the world. I'm not asking about the size, said the man. I'm asking about the pay. Those things kind of go uh, pretty hand in hand, I'd say. The next week was the same thing again. Every week the band would be in the bar wearing Metallica shirts. And the bartender would not give them any money. Finally, after five weeks, the bartender finally came in. I uh, came to see the band in... What is this? See the band in the dressing room and asked why they didn't why they didn't tip. Are you familiar with the stuff that draws them? The bartender asked. Of course, said the lead singer. It's the band that you've been not giving us money to tip. The bartender sighed. Well, they got a lot of money, he said. They make ten times what we do. They are the biggest cover band in the world. The guitarist picked up a bottle of scotch off the bar. I was kind of, ho kind of hoping this would get me to ten grand, he said. But I got a bad feeling that all that's going to do is get me to a hundred thousand. Yeah, that's more than ten grand, dude. Hey, wait a minute, the lead singer said. Let me finish. All I'm saying is that they have more money than we do. We need to be treated with the same respect. <laughs> I guess you'd rather rather have three dollar tips than fifteen thousand. <laughs> yes, the lead, the singer responded. I I replied, I would. Did you hear what he said? <laughs> then the guitarist said, Look, I know your situation. I'm going to tip you the three dollars and thirty three cents that you need to tip them. Thank you, but I don't have to do that. The lead singer said. <laughs> no, I insist. The guitarist said, You guys need to be treated like rock stars. Why else would they be paying all that money to be in the band with you? As the lead singer uh, said, Wow, thanks, the drummer added. Don't tell anybody. What? The singer cried. How are you going to keep this a secret? I know we don't have, m make a lot of money, but we need to start saving a little bit. In order to learn which bands are charging a cover charge. <laughs> but anyway... I'm going to have to end this video here. If you liked it, please subscribe. And comment. And like. And uh, the, the, I'll see you in the next video. Bye.